There was a kingdom. And in the center of this kingdom was a castle. A king lived in it. And around that castle was a great and very deep forest. Now there's something we need to know about kings. Kings are men with appetite, are they not? And this king one day fancied fresh venison cooked delightfully on his plate and he called his best hunter to him and he sent him out into the forest with the instruction to bring down a deer. He was never seen again. After a long time or a short time or an even longer time, the king realized that his best and finest huntsman was not going to return. And so he sent two more, his second best, out into the forest. He said, you go get me a deer and find that huntsman and bring him back. and they never returned. By now, Worry is moving through the whole castle. And so he calls all his finest hunters to him. You can see them now in front of you. You can see their hunter's bags. You can see the steam rising off their shoulders. You can see the ambition in their eye to please the king. And one by one, the beautiful shining boys took off into the deep woods. and were never seen again. Time passes, time passes like a flying arrow. And the old stories say, only a hawk would occasionally fly over that forest, or maybe a kestrel. So that's the way it went and people didn't go into that forest anymore. They didn't think about it. Until one day, a stranger, a young hunter with a dog showed up in the kingdom. Ah. He didn't speak to the man at the gate. He didn't speak to a servant, he went straight to the king and he uttered the immortal words, what kind of trouble can a young man get into round here? Remember the Irish, is this a private fight or can anyone get into it? Now the king seems to have less of Herod in him and something sweet, because he said, Sure, there's trouble here. But I see the sweetness of your eye, I see the pinkness of your complexion. And I have to tell you, many hunters have gone to the forest, none have returned. The return rate is not good. Do you know where I got that from? The return rate is not good. But it sounded good to the hunter. It sounded good to him. And so he went into the forest. His dog running ahead. And the dog came to the edge of a pond. And a great rusty red hand reached up out of the water and grabbed the dog and took it down. Down. What did he say? You gotta do what he said. <laughs> what the fuck? He didn't. He said, this must be the place. <laughs> That's that right. is a recommended attitude <laughs> in such a moment. <laughs> 
And this is another interesting thing that he did. He took not one more step towards the pond, but headed back to the castle. It's a sign of intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> and at that castle, he gathered three of the king's finest men, and they came back to the pond. They looked deep into its waters, and they said, well, there's something down there. Could be the Grendel. We don't know. But they got some buckets and they started the slow, unglamorous work of bucketing out the pond. Maybe it was a hot day. Nobody really knows how long it took to bucket out that pond. Several years, maybe? About 15. Yeah. For some of us. But at any rate, they did get it emptied. They weren't quite that passive. So they got it emptied. And there, laying stretched out in the bottom, is a great man, all red, rusty red, covered with hair. And so they took him and they took him back into the castle bound bound with thick rope People couldn't believe what they were seeing this rusty hairy man that in some way allowed himself to come down from the deep place, the lord of the deep waters, out into the brightly lit castle. But what to do with him? What to do with him? What to do with him? Well, the king thought it would be a good idea to put him on display. Oh, that sounds good. Mm. The wild man. Only a nickel. Yes. They put him in an iron cage. Yeah. In the middle of the central courtyard of the palace. And now it happened that that very courtyard was the favorite playground of the young prince, the son of the king, who was about eight years old. Can you imagine being eight and everything you've ever seen is neatly clipped and trimmed and golden and suddenly, right in the middle of your life, like some kind of hurricane, is a wild, hairy man in a cage with the deepest eyes you've ever seen. It's a funny thing because as time goes on, Life carries on at the castle. People seem to walk around the cage. They seem to do all the things they need to do. But that little lad is both spellbound and terrified all at the same time. So one day when he was playing there with his most beloved possession, his golden ball to his horror he dropped the ball and it rolled it rolled right through the bars and into the hands of the wild man Uh uh oh please sir Please, sir, could I have my ball back? <laughs> could I, could I have my ball back? Yes, you can. The terms are this. Get the key, unlock the cage, let me out. You'll get your ball back. 
Well, that was a very frightening idea, and the little boy ran away. But all night he thought about the ball. He did. He really wanted that ball back. In fact, he needed it back. So the next day, he got his courage up and he approached the cage again. Maybe his voice is broken now. Maybe five years have passed, maybe 15 years have passed. You know in the stories, when a day and a night pass, it means a long time in the walk of a man's life. So let's bring the voice down. Please, sir. Can I have my ball back? The same answer, yes you can. Get the key, unlock this cage, let me out, and I give you my word, you'll have your ball back. How can you possibly do that? How can you possibly open that cage when you've maybe got a little kid on the way? You've just moved into, uh, where would you be living? A gated community. A gated community. What if the hairy man comes to visit me in the gated community? I couldn't take him to the bar. He definitely wouldn't drink Budweiser Light. He'd want some Norwegian ale. So again, troubled, he left without his ball. Another night passes and he found himself again at the cage. Please, I really need that ball. And I would let you out, but I don't know where the key is. Oh, I can help you there. The key, the key is under your mother's pillow. No, no. No, no. Freud was right! Ah! Freud was right! Ah! Freud was right! <laughs> the key is under your mother's pillow. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one to wrestle, no one to joust, mm. nothing like that. Mm. No red night. Mm. It's under your mother's pillow. Mm. The lover's chamber. Mm. Mm. It's under the place where she dreams about your life and how wonderful it's going to be and what a good boy you're going to be. We hope he'll be a king one day, but if not, he could be a lawyer. He could be a lawyer. Or a doctor. Minister? Minister. That'd be good. School uh, storyteller. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> Not a storyteller. There's no money in that. He won't be a ro- wastrel nor a vagabond. No. He won't look like a roadie for Leonard Skinner. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I know, I know. None of that. But this time... It was as if the constellation of stars were just perfect. Because this time, he did it. This time, he took the lonely steps up to the door of his mother and father's bedroom and he opened it. What is the sound of that door opening? (laughs) (laughs) I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, 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 they have. (laughs) You know this only too well. And just as the hairy man said, just as the rusty man said, underneath that pillow was a key. Maybe the pillow was still warm with the feeling of her head. He slipped his hand in, took the key, and went back down to the cage. And he opened the door to the cage. 
And as he swung it open, the tip of one finger oh. was caught in the hinge. It pinched it hard, brought a little blood to the tip of his finger. And the wild man stepped out of the cage, stretched himself, stood up tall, mm. and prepared to leave. Oh, no, no, no. Do you know what it is like in your life when you've just done something fucking major? Something where there will be repercussions. He saw one door in his life closing, and now he saw the rusty man preparing to leave. And he said, Oh, holy mother, if my parents find out that you've gone, and surely they will, I'll be in more trouble here than ever I would anywhere else. Well, the hairy man looked him up and down, whose name, of course, was Iron John. And he said, you did a good thing for me, and I'll do a good thing for you. Get on my shoulders. Get on my shoulders. We should be so lucky. And so riding there on top of the great shoulders of the Iron John, the boy left his home. And they went deep, deep, deep into the forest. And they came to a little glade there, a little opening there where there was a beautiful spring of pure water. And Iron John sat the boy on the ground. He made him a bed of moss. That's a lovely thing. It's a delicate thing to do. He didn't throw him down on the rocks, he made him a bed of moss. If you've ever slept on a bed of moss, it can be a fragrant thing. And they made camp. And he said very clearly to the young man, you see this spring. And as the young man looked into it, occasionally a golden fish moved this way or that way. Maybe he even caught a glimpse of his face every now and then in that water. So your job, your sole job, your one responsibility is to make absolutely sure that nothing falls into that water because if it does, it will wrong the, wrong the spring. Wrong the spring. It'll wrong the spring. I will be away during the day. There are things I have to attend to. I want you to stay here in the radiance of this place and to make sure nothing gets in the spring. And so he took that job very seriously, as you can imagine. And he stayed there by the spring, making sure that nothing fell into the water, keeping it clear. But you remember that finger? Oh. Remember that finger? It was throbbing. Oh, yeah. It was beginning to throb. And the throbbing of the finger was incessant. And he started thinking about how good it would feel to dip that throbbing finger into the cool water of the spring. And you know, almost absent-mindedly, almost absent-mindedly, just for a second, his finger made a trail in the water and holy shit, suddenly... It turned to gold. It turned to gold. You know when you've done something like that, because when the wild man returned, did he waggle his gold finger in front of him and say, oh, whoops? No, he didn't. <laughs> we hide our gold fingers behind our back. Now the wild man looked him up and down, sniffed the air and said, hmm, how was your day? Oh, my day was fine, nothing much happened, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
I read the Forest Times, I drank some decaffeinated coffee, and that was about it. <laughs> Made out of nuts, squirrel nuts. And he said, I can see quite clearly, even before I see your finger, that you put your finger in the pond, you put your finger in the spring, but you're young, we'll let it pass this time. Let it pass this time. So they spent that night together. He slept in his bed of moss. Things seemed to be going well. The next day, Iron John said, well, I have things to do again in the forest. You know what your job is? Right. Guard the spring. Okay. Let nothing fall in the spring. I won't. Is it Got clear? It. It's crystal. It's crystal. <laughs> and so he sat there. And he did see his reflection. Didn't and he? it wasn't entirely unpleasing to him. Most of our lives we are defended against a sense of our own beauty. But when the wild man takes you to the water of life, you better be careful because you may catch a glimpse of how much beauty really lives in you. And when you witness real beauty, you can get distracted. Mm. Now, was it a hair? Mm. It he a leaned hair. over to look into his own eyes. Oh, yeah. And a single hair Just one. from his head, one hair, fell onto the surface of that water and turned to pure gold. Well, he fished it out right away put it in his pocket <laughs> and said nothing about it. Suddenly, everything goes quiet. The animals start making strange little noises and we know he is coming back. Maybe his antlers are moving this way and that way. And he comes back and he said, well, how was your day at the office? <laughs> Absolutely nothing happened. It was fine, it was a very quiet day. Occasionally an antelope moved this way and that, I saw a badger. Enough of that. Something went into the spring. Show it to me. He showed it the golden hair. The golden hair. Well, you gotta be careful. You need to pay more attention to what I'm trying to tell you, but I'll let it pass. Mm. Let it pass this time. This time. This time. That night, that night I think he dreamed of seeing himself in that water. That image. So that the next day he couldn't resist but to look again, could he? He had to look again. Can you imagine what it would be like to see your own face? And at the same time, those golden fishes are moving through it. How beautiful that would be, like some dream of the animal powers. Like a time when the man and the buffalo and the bear and the raven were in some sweet accord. That is what he saw when he looked in the spring. And with the intensity of his heart, he looked deeper. And as he looked, his hair fell from his forehead deep down into those waters of soul. And in an instant, his whole entire hair was solid, beautiful, radiant, solar gold. He immediately picked up some kind of headscarf. A bandana. He tied it up in a bandana. <laughs> <laughs> Tucked it all in, trying to hide every hair. But it didn't work. Nah. Nah. Well, wow. the rusty man came back. This time, he didn't even ask how the fucking day had gone by this point. He recognized a mythic rhythm when he saw one. He pulled the kerchief from his head. The golden hair tumbled to his shoulders. And he said, this time, 
I cannot let it pass. You have failed what I asked you to do. And because you have failed what I asked you to do, you have to leave this place of betwixt and between. You have to leave the forest. But I recognize something in you and I appreciate what you did with the cage. And so know this, I have more gold and I have more silver than anyone alive in this world. That's fucking incredible. I have more gold and silver than anyone in this world. And if you come to the edge of the forest and you call my name three times, I and John, I and John, I and John, I will come. And with that, he took him out of the forest and put him on a road. Ah, he had also told him something very important when he came to the forest. You will never see your parents again. You will never see your parents again. So don't even think about trying to take a track back the way you came. And all the time he had been in, his, in the forest, his parents had grieved accordingly. Because surely enough, they'd never see him again. So yes, he did leave on that new road. Iron John gave him the road leading to a land that he did not know. And we will leave him there, walking and wondering, walking and wondering what would become of his life. Good job. So the story, when we are in a room like this and the story is being breathed back into life, there's a kind of food, Robert calls it story food. There's a kind of food that goes into our body. And we don't even know we're hungry for it until we start receiving that food. But we need to give something back to the story call it feeding the story with some detail, some moment. As this, cool. as this is happening, I'm realizing in some ways this is probably the closest we have to our tribal story. I've never been in a room before knowing how many other men in the room have loved and moved through this story. There's something of the Lascaux Cave, you know? That's amazing. That's right. That's right. So whatever you have, if you have something to speak out, we want to hear it. You know, the, the, the part about, uh, I just made a connection from something that happened to me last night. That's, that, you know, the part about the keys underneath the mother's pillow and the description of there's nothing to fight for, and no, nobody, you know, no, nobody to go against with sword, and it's under the middle of mother's pillow. How do you, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Last night I was walking down the gravel road here about 10:30, and it's a little light that just barely shined on the road, and I was thinking, you know, uh, I could encounter anything on this road, mm -hmm. any wild beast that, uh, you know. Uh, a wolf, or a dog, or a bear, or something, you know, and I was prepared to face whatever came across this road at night to, you know, I, you know, I'm going to pass through this road. And what came out of the woods was a little skunk. <laughs> and I would have not been afraid if it was a dog or a wolf, <laughs> but it was a skunk that scared the hell out of me. How do I deal with that? I have no defense against that. <laughs> you know, it was you know, kind of like, you know, what are you doing in my woods? <laughs> you know, and when I came back, I had gotten a jug of water and a, 
thing and some Diet Coke, and I'm walking, and here comes that skunk in the same place. Back out. And he came at me. Wow. What am I going to do with that? You know. And, and, and how, how am I going to defend myself? How am I going to, how am I going to encounter that? And same thing with the mother's pillow. How am I going to deal with that? That's, that's, you know, I mean, how am I going to deal with getting that, you know, my father I can fight. You know, I can come up against him, but how do I come up against my mother? How do I, you know, go after that key? It, it's a different game. Uh, there, was, there was one word that wasn't spoken in the extrication of that key from the pillow. And that's a word that was very important in my life. Yeah. And that word is steal. steal. Yes. What that's that right. young man did is he stole that key just as I had stolen in my life with so much shame. And I carried that shame for years and years and years. And I came to this place and I told someone else this much about having stolen from my blood relations. And that man said, that's what men do. Men steal. And in that moment, <coughs> something changed. I was less ostracized by my own action than I'd ever been. I like to think from last night, larceny has its place. And it, and it's it with this key. And then the other thing with the pillow. And, uh, and then the smell of your mother. The mm -hmm. smell of your mother's hair. You know? mm -hmm. And it's like, that's, it's, uh, you know, you don't want to approach that. <laughs> what, you know. <clears throat> I recently told this story to a mixed group. Uh, and the women spontaneously applauded when he stole the key. Really? Yeah, a flutter. Really? A flutter of clapping. I had the exact same experience. Yeah. yeah. I was shocked. Yeah. And, and the response from the English women was, we would never have given him that fucking key. Never. Never. Uh, and a frisson of applause went through the room. You know, that the key part confused me because I didn't have to steal from my mother to get anything. Mm. So it's a completely foreign concept. You know, I understand kind of what I thought I had. <coughs> My dad wasn't around, I got whatever I wanted. Mm. Took it. I mean, maybe stealing was just something I was dead. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Still working that. I think it's important to remember that though there was no jousting match or wrestling match with the mother, um, the mother can be a harbor of safety and loyalty and love and comfort, mm. but the mother can also wear talons speak with a fork and tongue and wear a very long, sharp beak. Mm -hmm. So though, though there was no jousting match, that boy had to have the courage to go in there and rip that motherfucking key out of that room. There was risk. There was, there was, there was courage there. Yeah. Let's you get this guy over here. Yeah. No, um, I think like, um, what the symbol of the key means for me is really uh, while there's comfort offered in the mother and how she views uh, the son's life and what the son's going to be, you can, you can take comfort in that. It's the pushing yourself to again, not be passive, to steal that key, to separate yourself from the expectations <coughs> and the dreams that your mother has so you, that you can have your own dreams and you can journey as a man on your own, not under that umbrella. So that's what stealing the key means for me. Yes. It's taking that away. Well, my mother never got over my stealing the key. The last conversation I ever had with her before she died, uh, she told me how disappointed she was in how I had turned out. Oh God! <laughs> that, that I had that I was not normal like her. <laughs> and so I went home and wrote her a letter in her language, and simply said that I thought the path I had chosen was the path that God had chosen for me. And I had a choice of His or hers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she 
finally got it. She gave the letter to my sister, and my sister called and said, I wish to God I'd written that letter. <laughs> and, but I did see her one more time, and she, she couldn't talk, but she nodded and said, oh. it's okay. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> I have a, a rather general question. I'm not expecting an answer to it, and I'm, I'm new to this, and, I, and I'm new to the story. <laughs> I've read the story twice now, and what went through my, my head as I read it was, wow, that thing sure didn't work out the way that they could have, or perhaps I wish they would have. Oh, yeah. And yet, I can't go back and change that. Yeah. I can't go back to when I was eight. I can't go back to when I was 15. I can't go back to when I was 40. I, I'm here right now. And as my story is developed, there were a lot of perhaps good things in there that didn't happen, but on the other side, as a very result of those perhaps good things not happening, I learned other things. So I'm, I'm sort of this mixed bag of some really great things that I've learned as a result of my story, but still feeling like I really missed bits, and yet here I am, I'm 52 years old, and I can't go back to get the parts that you're supposed to get when you're 80 or 50 years old. So one thing that I'm sort of hoping to get from the next few days, is, and, and particularly from the story, is a little bit of, of, of hope and guidance as to how one can, even at whatever age you are, mm. <laughs> integrate some of those perhaps missing bits, mm. uh, building upon the strengths that you already knew that you've had perhaps because you didn't get those missing bits, mm. and ultimately for the sake not just of, of yourself personally, but for the sake of everybody else around you, and in my case, particularly for the sake of my young son. So that's sort of what I'm exploring and looking to, to, uh, to learn over the next few days. Thank you. Well, feeling the key, doesn't that imply that in the end you become an asshole to all the people around you? Have you decided no. to do that yet? I think I haven't done that. What this reminds me of, and this is my favorite part of the whole book, is the wounding. Yeah. Because that wounding is our gift. You say it so eloquently in the book, and when I talk about Iron John, this is what I talk about. That we've all been wounded, and when we heal that wound, when we were willing actively to put our wound into that water, whether that be therapy, whether that be 12-step work, whatever it is, that wound will turn to gold, and that will be the gift to your son. That will be the gift to our community. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a book right now called The Golden Wound, transforming, <laughs> transforming treasure or transforming trauma into treasure, because it's in this wounding. I almost feel like we elected to come here to be wounded in certain ways in order that we grow the gift that we are then going to give back to society. So I'm grateful. This is why I stood up last night and said my deepest shame about having an affair because it was that process that got me to the point where I am now. I'm grateful for the wounding. I'd like to add something suitably depressing to that. Uh, is, yeah, the wounds are significant, but to do what you're describing means you have to submit to far longer time cycles than contemporary culture is comfortable with. And what that means is, ultimately, a book or some form of expression comes from it. But if that book is to carry the grit of what you're describing, it, can very, can, it has to incubate normally for quite a long time, which means that you are going to feel dislocated and you're going to feel scared for long periods. It's not as if you just get a hit and you can turn it around quickly. Mm -hmm. In the fairy tales, I've been thinking about this recently, often a man has one night with the she or the other world and then seven years have passed in this time. And I've been thinking about the creative life and the soul life is a little bit like that. If you, if you want to dance with the fairies, if you want to meet the she, if you want to be in touch with the other world, you have to make a much longer commitment to your art because what the other world requires from you is far deeper than what we see around us. So I salute what you're saying and I also, there's the sobriety of how long that may take. I'll, I'll add a little more depression to, yeah. to that. Um, the, the, the fantasy of healing that we have it, in this culture is that uh, the, the wound will go away. Yeah. It'll turn to gold and, or it, you, you will be as you were before. Mm. 
And that is not the case. That's not what healing is. You're still fucked up. Right? And that is where you bring, that, that's what demands that you bring some creativity to it. Mm. And some generosity mm. to it. Mm. Mm. The thing I'd like to say too is uh, sort of on the upside of this. Which no. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not used to doing. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the story can be a marker of where you've been with your wound and where you are now at least it is for me that uh, the question would be is what part of the story really really impacted you 25 years ago mm. that's right and what part of the story really really impacts you now which which part of the story did you wrestle with for five years 10 years 15 years and 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 it and it's kind of like a map through your soul and mm -hmm. psyche. Mm -hmm. And uh, where are you now on that journey? That story can be indicative of. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, I, I, one of the things that I would like to hear sometime before the week is over about the story is <clears throat> just that journey. Yeah, 20 years ago when I heard it, this, this was what stood out today when I heard this excellent presentation of it. What stood out, you know, and, and, and uh, if you'll think about that and maybe even talk about it in your groups, mm. you know, that could be a way to deal with it. Yep. Thank maybe you, John. the symbolism of this, um, you know, you can never go back to your parents at this point, I mean, it's, you know, it's that, that we're not going back, that healing our wound is not going back to the way it was. You know, the wound may heal, but, you know, we're not going back to the way it was. That in, um, you know, even our parents in our lives, I and mean, not to be too much of a literalist, but when we go back to our parents now as we grow, and, um, you know, we're not really going back to them as we were when we were children. Um, so it, you know, for me, that's all part of it. It's like all the things that I do and go through change me. It's all about change and not going back to the way it was and hopefully for the better. Mm. Well, the way it was wasn't even the way it was. <laughs> you know, Thank you, John. That's what's weird about it. Mm. That's right. How for me, glaringly, was the bit where it was about the ball, about the ball, about the ball and incubating and incubating and this compulsive fixating, fixation on the ball. And even for me, going to get the key was the ball. You know, I think if, if for me, if I would have been thinking about the key, I wouldn't have been going up there. I was after the, I was regretful that, you know, my ego was regretful that I lost that ball. And, um, and I, I love the, the quick flip of the wrist, you know, that, that the impregnation that tips, he said, everything's sort of built to spill, it tips over into his rites of passage and he gets the key and he puts it in the lock and he turns the lock and he opens the gate. Where'd the fucking ball go? The whole paradigm shifted on him. And it wasn't about the ball anymore, it was about the fuck am I gonna do now? The whole the whole world shifted. That's right. And he got up on those shoulders and, and cruised, but there was and the ball's gone. There's no going back to the ball for me. Someone over there. Mm -hmm. I have a few pieces come to me during this telling. One was that uh, I think in our, in our culture being so violent, like for me, uh, murderous feelings are very, it's displayed usually very dangerous. And to me, for me, the story is like about murdering in some way, using the, having the, the availability of those murderous feelings to kill off the mother of the world and the mother's expectation, my mother's expectation, of my mother's need of what I think she wants me to be. <clears throat> And I remember even as a child, um, I would actually hide, uh, when I was angry at my mother, scissors under her pillow. Wow. And as a, uh, I remember in college, 
it was actually during Christmas, and there was like a tree and everything, and she was kind of petting my shoulder saying, you were once a really confident man, and you're not that anymore, and you need to accept it. And I remember wanting to kill her, and that really helped me wanting to kill her. <laughs> but whereas if I was trying to sort of like love her or accept her or rationalize it, I don't think I, I think I would have internalized it. Um, and right now, in terms of your morning lecture, I think uh, it still comes back to me in terms of my own passivity. And that's where I really need to be, to have that ferocity and that availability of murderous impulses to, to uh, not let the passivity take me over or not become complacent and, be, and have that sort of... It's almost like, for me, a murderousness that keeps my heart available at the same time. Just before we carry on, I'd, I'd like to backtrack a little bit into the story. Uh, first of all, I was really aware yesterday that there were quite a few folks that were new, which was brilliant. Uh, so I just wanted to say something that we wanted really is stories hit you in a on a variety of levels, and primarily initially emotionally. You know, you relate to a character in a story. Uh, but the, the, the idea of the, mythologi the mythic imagination is that somewhere swimming in you are all these characters. Within you is a paranoid king and, um, and an ambitious queen and someone that lives in the woods that is radiant. Or you, or you are connected to them at least. Okay? So one of the things to do is to keep that, as we go further into this story, is to not always associate with the central thing. Keep, keep your imagination wider than that and play with other, other places in it. Where are you? Something that struck me is the concern of the king when the strange young hunter appears at the beginning. It touches me that he warns him. Because when I think about uh, kings now, uh, certainly in England, I think many, there are many kings that send young hunters out into the forest deliberately with no hope of them ever coming back. In fact, we formed a group around this. I think it happens. We've got a strange thing at the moment. Uh, We've got a lot of, in warfare, we are over in Afghanistan and places like that. And what's happening with the English is that they're getting killed less by the Taliban or anyone like that. And the sh it's the shitty equipment they've got. It's the shitty equipment. On one level, they are being half prepared for a situation that ultimately is going to kill them. Uh, when I think about initiation in ancient Greece, there used to be a ritual where a man or a woman priest would dress as a, w they'd put on the mask of a boar, it's in the book, and they'd have a scythe, and a man would be cut and he would bleed to death. And at some point in the intelligence of those communities, they realized it could be symbolic rather than literal. When a culture has lost its mythic imagination, we revert we become literal and we become concretized. And what was worrying me is that we are sending men out into the forest as some form of prime, primeval libation. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're trying to pay some dark debt off. And the less clear we are, the less we don't know what fucking story we're in, the more likely that is to happen. So that was my thought in the beginning, was the concern of the king was sweet to me. Sorry. Another one. Yeah. This pillow is also the place of the, of the sexual energy and the tension between the mother and the father. And it strikes me that the taking of the key is also a fuck you, dad, a mm. rebuke of the father. As much as it is this, this intimacy that's taken from the mother by the key. Something that's not discussed that I often think about is how the hell did the mom get the key to begin with? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I had a dad in my life, but he just wasn't fucking there, ever. You know, he was always working, doing something else, you know, playing with other kids, not me. And so, and being the youngest of two older brothers, you know, there was, you know, a lot of that situation mm -hmm. happening. And so my anger with the whole situation that I really resonated with was, because the mom in my house was in charge. You know, mom was everything, you know. and. Growing up in a world full of females and being very female dominated, I have always had these issues with being around men. And that's the reason why I got in men's work, was to try to like find guys who could actually heart to heart connect and talk to. Because everybody in my generation is just two words, oh cool, yeah. You know? 
And that just wasn't me. I wanted to be more open and talk about stuff. And that's the thing that I just really got angry about my dad about was, why did you give your power to the queen? Yeah. Why did you give that power that you've had that you should have been representing to me, but I wished I could have saw in you, that then I portrayed in my relationships with females? You know, oh, here, I'll give you the power, because that's, that's what we do as men and lose my power in it. So that's the question I always had was, wow, how did that key get from the king's hand? Because the king sent the guy out there to go get it, and then comes back and bring it in. He locks the door. Here, wife, take it. Where did she put it? Under her pillow. I think there's just some amazing symbology in that about how men give away their power to females. Here, balance my checkbook. Like you said, I can't do it. Wow. Be in charge of your own destiny. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. Thank you. As soon as the hunter came into the story, I immediately thought of uh, the hunter and the dog as the fool from the tarot. Mm -hmm. And so when his dog gets eaten up, you gotta think he's eventually gets on the road and he's lost. Like where what is he gonna do without his dog? He's lost his gold ball and he's also lost his dog. That's two different it's, two different it, it's, it's cool, but if you heard it that way, that's fine. But the hunter and the boy are, are different. Mm. Yeah. The hunter is not the boy. The boy is the father of the king. So, oh, so the hunter just falls out of the story. Yeah, the hunter is never yeah, mentioned again. Brothers. Strange. Relate my own life to kind of this story, and then you know, with whatever being alive for 41 years and very much embracing kind of that, that princely role mm. and having an idea of what it is to be king. But then, as I lived the life as you know, parents, my mother pictured would be good, and trying to internalize that and getting to a place of saying, Okay, I achieved all these things of having family and having a decent job. And, and still feeling kind of an emptiness, for lack of a better term. And I kind of found through my own inner turmoil of being going from not from a prince to a king, but a prince to a wild man, of, of having all these emotions and turmoil kind of bubble up within myself. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a good, bad thing, but it's kind of where I was at. And so I guess it's interesting in my own life to say, you know, as I look to kind of go beyond that trick of, or not trick, but the transgression from a prince to a wild man and say, well, it, it's possible to get to, you know, that kingly state, but there, there's part of that process that I'm missing. And for me, you know, very much stealing that key and taking a key and taking a responsibility for my own life and not looking for others to do that for me it is the process that I'm going through now. So I mean, the, the story helps me to kind of make sense of, of where I'm at, so. I want to come back to this guy that, that had the, the hunter and the, and the boy conflated. Just because the way you hear the story is important. Don't, don't throw that away. Don't let us tell you, oh, you got that fucking wrong. You know, that, that, th when you hear something that we didn't say, that's important. Mm. That's, 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 that's part of your story. Mm. Or maybe it is. Anyway, it's worth considering. Yeah. What you said earlier um, was that uh, it's like a dream interpretation in the sense that all of you is there mm. in, in every part. So I think he was right in that there was some part of the boy, the, of us, <coughs> that boy, that hunter, uh, that it represented maybe the, the, the careless, uh, carefree boy this dog uh, that we can hard to think and understand when we're kids and whatever. But, but I do think, you know, if, if what you're saying, I, I yeah, what you're saying. yeah, can you can you imagine the impact of being again some little some little lad sort of waddling around in your in your sort of neatly trimmed castle, and then there's some guy with a bag and it's full of sharp things, and he goes out into the forest. You know a culture is sick when only one person can go out and in. 
you know there's no effective rites of passage program in that area if it's one person going in or out. You know, so yeah, you're right, it is very blurred. I had always felt that if you've, if you've gone through this process, the, where, does, where does the hunter come from? The hunter is a man that's gone through this process. He's the man that, that's brave enough, smart enough, has, has had his passage, and is willing to, to, to go into the forest despite the risk. So in that sense, perhaps that's the boy after he's, after he's gone through the whole process. This is he something that, that you're catching it, Martin, and I talked about earlier this morning, is, and we, need to, we wanted to talk about this, so it's good, is that the hunter comes from outside comes from outside into the kingdom. The answer to the dilemma that exists in any given structured system is not in the system. It comes from outside. Mm. 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 That's it. That's right. That's it. The key, the the key kingdoms is, is the strange. Hunters couldn't do it. The strange hunter wanders in. Genius lives on the margins. You know, and if you study any Arthurian myth, and there are all sorts of parallels in Arthurian myths with this story, it's, yeah, it's Parsifal, turn, when Parsifal turns up in court, the court is actually in chaos, and a woman laughs because the finest knight in the land has just wandered in, but that's another thing. So yeah, you're right. He wasn't part of the corporate culture. No, he's talking. <laughs> I just wanted to try and uh, expand on that a little more. Uh, the hunter only found Iron John because his dog was the dog. And the dog could be viewed as our animal nature. Um, and sometimes I think that the reason we made, you know, have relationships with dogs going back to old days was because we needed them more than they needed us. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried about what happens to the hunter. Mm -hmm. I just thought someone else might. That's good. On the, on the literal level, I can't tell you how many men have told me over the years that I didn't weep when my father died, I didn't weep when my mother died, but when my dog died, I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. <laughs> and then the next question would often be, what's wrong with me? Right. Why, why oh, yeah. would I not shed yeah, a tear yeah, at my father, yeah, but yeah. my dog? And again, I'm talking about the yeah, literal level, yeah. but I'm also talking about something of the animal world mm. that calls forth grief mm. in a way that the human world cannot quite tap into. What, what part of that have we mm. lost mm. that when the literal dog dies, mm. it brings up that part? that we know we've lost. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and the death is important. The death is important because any initiatory story is full of these crossroads moments and small deaths. Mm. And I would trade a little dog for the big life mm. that is being offered at mm. the spring. Mm. Uh, so what is being opened up to the young boy when he goes on the shoulders? I mean, the Im imagine what that's like. You're suddenly on the shoulders Imagine the panorama, imagine the views as you leave the kingdom. It's like you've graduated or you've run out of college or you're just fucking gone. You're gone. But he seems to take, he seems to take this guy into the sort of the dreaming of the land. I work a lot with Aboriginal teachers uh, from all cultures. I've been a wilderness rites of passage guide for a long time. And they say this, it takes three days and three nights before you start to dream the land and they call it wild land dreaming. And you can see it's why we fast for four days, not for three. We fast for four because after four days, the land itself starts to come through and into your psyche and your body. And it's very depressing for me when I meet hundreds of men saying, well, it's too late for me to have an experience like that. Bullshit. Don't fucking talk to me about that. You, that's, that's, that is a castrating lie. Yeah it's, not, alibi. yeah, it's not to do with your age. It's simply to do with getting quiet and taking yourself into the bush. You don't need the teachings of a Buddha. You don't need the teachings of a medicine man. You don't need to do any of that. What you need to do is go to the place they go 
when they're looking for real soul nourishment. And so the thing is, there's that grief in us when we hear he was taken to the spring. He saw his true reflection. He had a mentor. Something that's interesting for me is when, when this story first impacted through Robert's work 20, 25 years ago, a lot of the men that heard it were maybe in their late 30s and early 40s. Guess what? Many of you are 60 now. It's the perfect time. You know, God bless you for, what were you saying? If you haven't been fed, become bread. If you haven't been fed, become bread. For, for younger guys like myself, it's so nourishing to come here and be around men that are holding something and magical for us. So thank you for doing that. Anyway. Mm. I'm moved to say at, at this moment, I, I heard, well, it was 26 years ago when I walked into the woods uh, to a whole bunch of, uh, of, uh, of Iron Johns. Uh, uh, James Hillman sort of lift me up on, on his shoulders. Uh, Robert Bly lifted me up on his shoulders. Yeah. I came wandering in not knowing shit. And uh, they really did trouble me to, uh, to live a different life. And uh, that was, but I would not have, I had to be lifted up by That's something great. much bigger That's and great. greater. Right? A, a view of, that I would never have known. So Yates could lift someone up. Or precisely, precisely, or horse. coming to a remote Chautauqua with learned men in a place like this. That's a so the question is, too, who lifted you up, yeah. or who did not, oh. as of yet? Oh. Who did, or who did not, as of yet? Because there's always men who will say, I don't have a mentor. I haven't had, that's what I'm looking for, and so, you know, speak the name to yourself or of the person's shoulders that you rode in on, you know, because those men talk about blessing. Mm. Certainly don't worry about if they're alive or not. Right. That's, that's mm. a, that's a, that's a. What did you say? Don't worry about yeah, if they're alive not. or not. Uh, you know, we, one of the <coughs> things we often talk about in, in meetings like this is community. And I, I really believe that a third of the community should live in our imagination. I think it's a mistake when we're all living in a tiny house doing sweat lodges ten times a day and arguing over our breakfast. You know, I like living <laughs> reasonably separately. I'm sorry to break it to you. Uh, and and I, I think that actually 